Last week, a 17-year-old mentally unstable girl named Christina Coingard was shot dead by police after she entered a police station in Longview, Texas, allegedly with a knife. And this week, the Longview Police Department released a video of the incident, showing that she was already subdued for nearly 30 seconds before lunging toward police and getting fatally shot. Well, in light of this incident, earlier I talked to hip-hop artist and activist, Immortal Technique, and I first asked him why U.S. police policy leads to so many deaths. The police force has a policy uh, that they don't shoot to injure. Uh, they shoot to stop an opponent, and to, uh, to stop uh, a quote-unquote perpetrator means stoppage means death. It, it, a lot of times they have, there's no policy to injure, you know what I mean? There's no mm -hmm. policy to shoot to wing. Um, when you actually take shooting classes, you realize people don't aim for the head, they don't typically aim for the arm or the shoulder or the leg because it's a much smaller center of mass. Not to make a technical issue out of something that's obviously very human and not to take the humanity out of it, but that's the policy, you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. the cold, rigid policy that when people shoot, they're not shooting to injure, they're not shooting, they're shooting to stop, which means they're shooting to kill. Right, and so I guess if you have a gun and you're trained this way, um, it should be about the policy change, but, but I, I can't help but think about how um, other police agencies don't even carry guns in, in many countries across Europe, and I'm talking about even countries that have, you know, 15th, even 4th and 3rd in gun ownership in the world. Uh, I mean, clearly this reduces police killings, but what do you think about the idea of completely disarming police forces? Uh, listen, you know, I, I've said this to my, my friends on the left, we're never going to get rid of guns. Uh -huh. And then I've said to my friends on the right, we're never going to get rid of abortion. You're going to have to accept those two things about America. You may not like those things, but they've always been a part of this culture, and they've always been a part of this society. It would be, it, you would have to change the virtual nature of this country, and that would be interesting. I, I don't know how that would necessarily affect uh, international terrorism and it, it, its effect here. I don't. It would obviously have an effect on certain crime. If a regular citizen can't get a weapon and a criminal can, also having a weapon not to take the side of a gun enthusiast, but having a weapon is the only thing that puts a 90-pound female on the same or a woman, excuse me, on the same level as a 300-pound mugger slash rapist. I mean, uh, that sort of logic worked in the past, but now I think that as we see the ramifications of people that have mental disorders, mental illness, individuals who should be screened, I mean, you have to be of a certain caliber to apply for certain jobs in, in this country or to have certain privileges. You have to pass a test to drive a car. You know, a car could definitely be used as a weapon. Um, a yeah. gun is a weapon. Right. So I, I think that in terms of having uh, lax rules about getting them, I've always been opposed to that. But I know that there are a lot of people who don't live in a big city like New York. You know, I, I understand that. I have relatives in Virginia. I have relatives in, in Florida. I have relatives in Georgia. You know, they live 45 minutes away from the nearest police station. What mm -hmm. do they do when there's a criminal, when there's a prowler, when there's an intruder? You can't call the cops and wait an hour for them to show up. And to be honest, Abby, here's another reality about uh, policing and the police force. A lot of times their job is to gather evidence uh, to find the person and then hold them responsible for the crime that they did. They typically don't run into a scenario and jump in front of a bullet to stop other people from dying. You know, just like how in the movies, during a court proceeding, someone breaks down and gives away themselves at the end. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. You know, I, I think that when people understand that the police can help them only to a certain degree, and that a lot of this has to be personal responsibility, this isn't echoing a right-wing sentiment. It's echoing the logicality of a lot of people's lives. Now, could they use non-lethal devices, um, stun guns, tasers? Maybe. I mean, mm -hmm. that's different. I, I think, though, that other people have had a lot of other interactions with society um, and with dealing with that over time without having the overwhelming uh, pink elephant in the room of the gun lobby, which, you know, doesn't 
doesn't care about anything but a profit margin. The fact that it talks about the Second Amendment is absurd. It never even mentions the Dick Act or anything else that came up during the early 1900s that then regulated the Second Amendment. I mean, these aren't even conversations people are willing to have from that sphere. Why? Because their purpose is not to protect gun owners. Their purpose is to protect the shareholders who have uh, stock in a lot of these weapon companies, which I, is the unfortunate reality. Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting concept, disarming the police. But I mean, yeah, absolutely, there there'd be no way in hell that uh, the country would be disarmed ever. And of well, course, police would never allow that to happen unless the entire country was first. In these scenarios, typically when people find themselves um, prisoners of the state, it's it's not the the guns that have been taken away that are the most damaging. It's the small subtleties of their freedom that have been chipped away over the course of years. Uh, whether when people point to examples like Germany or, or in the 30s and 40s or, or China um, before the Maoist revolution and they point, oh, people took away those guns. That wasn't the first thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, please, th th that was the icing on the cake in, mm -hmm. in those scenarios, and that's unfortunate for a lot of people to glaze over. Um, the, the things that they're cheering for, uh, that they think are national pride, are actually the precursor to a lot of these draconian... I mean, these draconian laws are the precursor as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these things then become almost the introduction to a fascist state, as opposed to the final example, which would be disarming a population. You're right. I mean, all these different freedoms, you can't see them. They're not tangible in front of us, you know, so guns obviously right. are. The, it's easier to say the that. Ta the taking away of guns is an emotional issue and a, and a constitutional one as well, but it would be the final thing that would happen, right. which is why they would never do it first. They would never do it, you know, second, third, fourth. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing mm -hmm. that happens, or the, one of the last things that happens when you have a, a, a military dictatorship or a fascist state, like many of our allies, like many of Russia's allies, like many of China's allies do. You know what I mean? We, we, we are more than willing to point the finger at individuals who don't have our national interests, but we are unwilling in any way, shape, or form to make some sort of public criticism from an administrative level, from the administration themselves, of our allies who do this. And that's the only people whose behavior we can really change. Right. You can't change a stranger's behavior, but you know what? You can't tell someone across the street, you're an alcoholic, stop drinking. They don't have any cause to listen to you. They don't know you, and they have no reason to even stay there and listen to you. However, you can't affect your uncle, you can't affect your cousin, you can't affect your brother, you can't affect your sister. Those are the people we can affect. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, since we're unwilling to do that because they carry our national interests or because they're in bed with our corporations, we don't hold them to those standards. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter ha has been the mantra, obviously, surrounding the anti-police brutality movement ever since uh, Mike Brown. And, and, of course, black Americans are disproportionately impacted by cops. Uh, but shouldn't the conversation, of course, as someone who talks about class warfare constantly, should be on class warfare instead of race? Um, I think definitely class keeps race where it is. It keeps sexism where it is. It keeps... Uh, militarized police where they are, but I think that a lot of people have taken the argument out of context. Uh, I think it's horrific when I hear things like uh, when people assume the morality of the community or, or they assume certain, they say thing, very racist things, mm -hmm. subtly racist things like, you know what, you don't care when someone in your community dies, you only care when it's a cop. Well, let me stop you there. First of all, Abby, when anyone in our community dies, that leaves a huge hole in our hearts. That, that is a devastating loss. It doesn't matter who it is or how they died, but the difference is that 99% of the time, if that person who killed our family member, our brother, our sister, our friend, um, if that person's caught on camera doing it, either with a weapon or with their bare hands, 99% of the time they're going to prison. Um, the other part is that if a police officer does it, and even if it's caught on camera, even if you see him, pull out his gun and shoot a child on the floor, you're still not going to have the same sort of consequences that you should. You may lose your job, but 99% of the time, you're not going to prison for the crime of murder. Mm -hmm. um, and that shows the total inconsistency and the lack of accountability um, from not only 
police departments, but also from this administration who lacks the courage to confront these issues head on and does them in a very subtle manner and without being as forceful as I believe it has the power to be. Recently, I put out a statement where we talked about uh, police uh, brutality yeah. slash police enforcement, and I reminded people this is not a left-wing issue. Um, yes, there are people who are calling for more accountability, who are calling for a special prosecutor. You know, the Justice League in New York has done an incredible amount of work on the ground. Um, but remember, that's because those people's rights, our people's rights, your people's mm -hmm. rights are guaranteed by the Constitution. However, people would be foolish to think it's a left-wing issue. We just had a conversation about guns. When people do come confiscate guns from someone, Abby, who do you think they send? Mm -hmm. Do you think they send that right, the, the right-wing lie of some UN peacekeeper invading American soil? Do you think they're going to send a black community activist to come take your guns, my friends on the right? No, they're not. They're going to send the local police or the SWAT team, those people that get hate mail every single day from individuals that have their guns confiscated. So do you understand that it's not a left-wing issue? It's not a right-wing issue. It's just an issue about power. Right. Let's talk about France, uh, Felipe, because recently an eight-year-old child, let me repeat that, eight-year-old child was questioned by police for his alleged support for terrorists. I mean, he was just this tiny little kid, confused. I mean, what contributes to this collective hysteria that takes over entire countries after terrorist attacks? Is it the media, the government, or just human psychology? I think it's probably a combination of all those three, if those are the only three doors I have to choose from. Um, but I think that it's probably a, a lot more than that. There's also a long history of discrimination. Um, there's colonialism to take into place. But let me just say this, that um, people have talked about Muslims apologizing for the, uh, the terrorist attacks in France. Um, and then I've heard people say, well, if Muslims have to apologize, then do Christians have to apologize for uh, the KKK or for the West ba Borough Baptist Church? <laughs> Do Catholics have to apologize because of the Pope uh, and because of his protection of child molesters for all that time? It, it, didn't they hide behind religion as well? But I want to take it a step further, Abby, and I want to apologize for those attacks, not because I perpetrated them, but because someone of my demographic committed them. Ninety percent of these terrorist attacks are not committed by Christians, not committed by Muslims, not committed by Jews, not committed by people of any religion. They're committed by men. So if that's the case, and we're talking about people apologizing for things, then don't me as a man and every single man in the world have to apologize for those things? And to add on to that horrific display, I, I just want to make it personal for, for the audience out there. I, I asked a woman I was dating once, and I hope that the men out there have the courage to ask this, too. I asked her, are most men that, that you've been in a relationship or dealt with, are they understanding, are they kind? You know what I mean? I, I've never hit a woman in my life, Abby. Mm -hmm. I, I was raised better than that. I asked her an honest question. And it wasn't like this woman had an overly hard life. You know, she hadn't been sold by her parents. But she said, no, honestly, the majority of men that I've met in my life or just come across have been objectifying. They've been sexist. So I'm, I'm not here to present a bleeding heart. I'm here to use logic and reason and say, aren't 90 percent of these attacks committed by men, regardless of what religion they represent. The Crusades was carried out by men. The attacks from the KKK were carried out by men. Anders Breivik is a man. But the reality is that behind terrorism, we hide these other things, not just the sex or the religion or, or any other thing, but we assume the mentality of people. We assume the mentality of a terrorist. And let me explain what I mean by that, Abby. People in this country assume the reason that people have done this is because of simply a fanatical belief. And I'll tell you, as a person that ventured to Afghanistan, as a person that ventured to a, a lot of places in the world, I saw a few fanatics. I ran across a few fanatics. But you know what I ran across, too? Mostly, I ran across poor people. I ran across a lot of mercenaries. You can't tell me that people are doing this because they just have some religious belief. You know, selling heroin has no place in the Quran. These people aren't 
uh, uh, just international t uh, a radical terrorists that believe in some fundamentalist ideology. Abby, let's call them what they are. They're a bunch of drug dealers. You know, yeah. are, 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 the, are the Colombian drug lords Christian fundamentalists? Most of them go to a Catholic church. Are the Peruvian drug lords, even though 20% more coke comes out of Peru than Colombia, but we don't hear that phrase, mm -hmm. Peruvian drug mm -hmm. lord. Mm -hmm. However, don't they go uh, get, get uh, don't, don't they, aren't they allowed to get communion at a Catholic church, which they've probably funded? Well, I mean, so, I, that's so the reality easy, that we're talking right? about. So do we talk about them? Do we say that they're hiding behind their Christianity? You know, that's the, that's the sadness that we're dealing with, a lack of logic and a lack of understanding. Yes, we need to protect this country. By protecting this country, how about not arming fanatics and maniacs who we can't control and just sending them um, to fight a regime that we would like them to topple so we don't have to take responsibility or spend the lives of our own military. That doesn't work. How, we learned that lesson in Afghanistan. Now we're relearning the lesson in Syria. It, it, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't you know, take make sense. Take away the paycheck. Take away the paycheck from a lot of these people. Follow the money trail that comes from the Gulf states and you take away that paycheck and half those people will leave. Right. I mean, They're not it, it, here for your it, revolution. They yeah. expect to be well paid. Yeah, and the FSA fighters are even saying that they're 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 joining ISIS because you know they don't like the bombing campaign. It's completely insane. Then we saw what happened with the Russian extremists with the, the shooting down of the airliner. I mean, it's just unbelievable how we don't ever learn, uh, Felipe. Let's talk about Richard Dawkins because it seems like people like Bill Maher, Richard Dawkins jump on the bandwagon every time things like this happen and just just to bash Islam. Uh, Dawkins tweeted. No, all religions are not equally violent. Some have never been violent. Some gave it up centuries ago. One religion conspicuously didn't. What's your response to these kind of statements from so-called liberal atheists? Because they have enormous um, just influence. Right. I mean, obviously, uh, well, first of all, he's, th that's patently false um, because you're looking at it from a perspective where you think because someone has a religion and they commit violence, they're committing violence for the religion. The, he's assuming the mind of a terrorist as well, as if you can tell why people do things. You know, um, when the when the, those little girls were killed um, in the civil rights movement by a bombing, was that person excused? Did they hide behind their Christianity? We would have laughed at that. We would have said, no, you're a criminal. You're a murderer. Don't hide behind your religion. Come out from behind that and go to jail. And don't go to jail because you're a Christian extremist. Go to jail because you're a murderer and a killer. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the reality that we're talking about. Now, there are definitely radical uh, Islamists that I've seen on YouTube. You know, people that were saying things that were so preposterous that they definitely do need to be challenged and ripped out of power. Individuals that said things like they would blow up the pyramids because mm -hmm. those were idols. You know, I, I, these people obviously can't be reasoned with, but at the same time, they're no different than the West Borough Baptist people. They can't be reasoned with anyone right. <laughs> or either. So I, I think the difference is that you look at one thing, and I think that his nearsighted analysis is based off of a lack of historical understanding. Mm -hmm. Because these overt wars that we have are not just to confront terrorism, they're to consolidate power here at home. You know, when the Crusades happened, something that's left out of history is that half the Crusades weren't against Muslims, Abby. They were actually against other Christians. In fact, the Fourth Crusade toppled the, the, what was left of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Fourth Crusade in, in 1204 AD. And I think that without these understandings, without knowing that, yes, the Catholic Church was in the throes of irrelevancy at the time. So it needed to have some sort of power rebuilt and a base around it. But it wasn't just to cause wars overseas and take bounty home. It was to consolidate power back where we are. England's power is waning in the world. England is no longer the relevant thing that it was 100 years ago. As a matter of fact, it sold a lot of its businesses to us. You know, think about this. What did Britain control? It controlled India. Who did India call when it was invaded by China during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis? It didn't call England. It called us. Felipe. Um, we used to control, the, the Britons used to control Iraq. Who controls Iraq now? Us. Right. The Britons had Transjordan and Palestine. Those things are broken up. Who's Jordan a client state of? 
hours. You know, over the course of the show, I've been told by so many people that my tone is way too angry, that I show way too much emotion when I speak about these issues, but I really just can't help it because I, you know, I come from this activist background. What's your response to people who say that about your music? Well, I mean, I say that those people have never come and had a public conversation with me. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go on tour in March, uh, April with Talib Kweli, and uh, it's called the People's Champions Tour. Besides the shows, we're trying to arrange as many college visits as we can to open it up to have some kind of town hall meeting. And I've never turned away people that have come to me um, with an open heart, with a disagreement. You know, I've, I've never been a person that shunned that. Uh, if you approach me and say racist things like a troll on the internet, I'm not gonna take you seriously. But if you, you stop and say, hey, did you ever consider this particular point? That's what we want. We want people to put those ideas on the table. We want to be challenged, not in a negative way, but in a positive way, because only through constructive criticism do people grow. People who don't accept any criticism are the people that don't grow at all. And you know what? Yes, I'm passionate about these issues. Why? Because friends and family have gone overseas to fight. That means that our lives have been personally put at risk. You know, that means that it's not a question of, quote, unquote, supporting the troops. Of course we support the troops. We want them to come home alive. We never wanted them to fight an illegal war in the first place. The real question is, do we support the policy set up by the Bush regime under a false premise and extended by the Obama regime? Do we support mm -hmm. those policies? Not just the blanketing of that, not the oversimplification and the narrowing of war into a two-hour movie. No, that, that you're not, you're, you're, it's not like you're not a patriot just because you find that intellectually insulting. I, I think that we have to search deeper than that. We cannot simply be governed by emotions or governed by by simple rhetoric. You know, there, there has to be some tangible critical thinking behind it. And that's the only way we're going to preserve the republic at all. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for the incredibly enlightening conversation, as always, Felipe Coronel. Everyone, check out the tour with Talib Kweli coming up. Mortal Technique, artist, activist revolutionary. Thanks so much, man. Harlem.